All right, I'm here with Caitlin and Alan uh, to talk about, among other things, hydrogen power. But we're starting with Alan, who's going to talk about Conti. Krebs on security, Brian Krebs, good old Brian Krebs, always good for a story. He's got a, a really interesting one on Conti, which is, of course, one of the heavy, heavy players, the big hitters in ransomware. Conti, of course, got in uh, a lot of internal turmoil when Russia invaded Ukraine because some members of Conti apparently are Russian, whereas others are uh, Ukrainian. Oh. And the organization in its official channel made an announcement about how it fully supports Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Ukrainian members did not appreciate that and it looked like the organization was going to implode. Mm. But before doing so, they did manage to uh, ransomware Costa Rica's government, pretty much the whole darn government. And uh, quite impressively, the Costa Rican government refused to pay up. So uh, Costa Rica is still in a bit of a pickle as regards its IT infrastructure. And according to Brian Krebs, now Costa Rica is facing yet another ransomware attack, this time on its public health infrastructure. A number of health clinics have been essentially shut down thanks to another ransomware actor. Um, and uh, that, uh, you know, this is obviously a very serious problem for the uh, Ukrainian uh, health uh, ministry and for the, the citizens of Costa Rica, because now people cannot get their uh, medications in some cases and cannot get adequate um, health uh, service. Clinics are being shut down. So what uh, what uh, Brian Krebs has uh, discovered, or what he's reporting on here, is that apparently this new attack is possibly actually part of Conti, and that Conti may be in the process of a rebranding, and that they're going to make a comeback, but under a new name. This is not the first time that a uh, a, a ransomware operator has gotten into trouble and appeared to disappear only to come back later. So um, <clears throat> Krebs talked to a Costa Rican um, uh, cybersecurity expert and CEO of ATTI Cyber, who uh, identifies this attack as being part of UNC 1756. It's an unclassified organization using the Mandiant uh, classification scheme. But there are indications that this new ransomware group, which goes by the handle of Hive, may in fact just be the Conti actors uh, rebranding themselves. So it's definitely an interesting situation to look uh, to, to watch out. And um, if you hear about Hive in the future, it may be just the Conti actors doing the same old thing, but under a new name. Well, Hive is a pretty good name. That UNC 1756 is terrible. I thought they were doing pretty good with the Evil Corp and the Russian Business Network. These guys need yeah, proper branding advice. Yeah, the, the top 10 top ten ransomware actors do have pretty good names like uh, Darkseid and uh, yeah. Revil and Klopp. Ryu. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd say uh, Hive fits right in. Yeah, the, the whole idea of rebranding ransomware people as if someone can soil their good name is yeah. just hilarious. Well, the ones that hacked Colonial Pipeline did like try to dissolve because they were afraid of the blowback. Yep. Was that Conti? I think that's one that's gone now. Revil? I forget which one it was. But they freaked out when they discovered what a hornet's nest they'd stepped into. Anyway, yeah, that was so, Revil. That was Revil, yeah. Well, Caitlin is going to complain about cryptocurrency against some people. Just don't see the glory of cryptocurrency. I know all I do is I seem to complain about cryptocurrency nonstop. That's my stick now. Uh, so CNN Business has an article by uh, uh, Ramashad uh, and Maruf uh, talking about how one billion dollars, one billion, one billion dollars has been lost in cryptocurrency scams since 2021, uh, and that's that's. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Uh, so what's going on? So apparently, according to this article, uh, scammers are uh, 
just going all out on cryptocurrency. This is the big, big ticket finding marks. Um, and most of the people being milked are not like older people that don't know what they're doing on computers. Apparently the majority um, at 70%, uh, the majority of people are young, like they're in their twenties and thirties. Yeah. Uh, the most, most, yeah. So they're between the ages 25 um, to 40. They're three times more likely to lose money through fraud. And how is the fraud being perpetrated? You might ask. Well, crypto scams are using um, uh, social media. Social media again. Yeah, but I think they're mostly rug pulls, right? They just get you to invest in something right. and then they right. steal the money and run away. <laughs> exactly. So they'll they'll guarantee you in a return of you know ten percent or something. Mm -hmm. You got to invest, uh, and then they'll they'll pull the rug away. Um, you know, the, they'll they it's social engineering. Yeah. They, try to get people that they're really preying on people looking to get rich quick, uh, which is a good indication that you're in the wrong area. If your monetary plan or your monetary investments involve getting rich quick, uh, it's probably not a good investment and it's very likely a scam. Um, and so what the FTC, FTC recommends is that if you are investing in cryptocurrency and someone just guarantees a return on your investment, step away. That is the big red flag right there. Not that, not that you're going to make big wins, but just that you're going to get a guaranteed return um, is enough for you to see that red flag. So only invest in things that are failing. <laughs> oh, they, they can fail. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, if, if you are not only invest the money that you're willing to lose. Yeah. You know, there was a report from one of the big companies, I think maybe Verizon just showing loss due to all kinds of fraud. And the number one fraud was romance scams. Yeah, ro even more. yeah, so yeah, I mean, in, in our field, we focus a lot on the technical details of what it means to, you know, hack into someone's account, um, you know, get past the logins through like a SQL injection or something. But the fact of the matter remains that the number one attack that's stealing billions of dollars from people is just social engineering, people pretending to be other people or pretending to have businesses, just low level, stupid scams. Always has been, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Yep. All right, and I got a couple articles, one from Zero Hedge, which uh, I don't often quote, but they got a good one this time. I think they're pointing out that the great, after having the huge stimulus payments that greatly inflated the dollar, now inflation is going up. So now the government leaders want to hand out more payments, which they haven't tax to pay for in order to help people pay for the inflation, which is, you know, like putting out a fire by pouring gasoline on it. And uh, the zero hedge writer is very, very scornful of this. I think justly so. Although when I, I mentioned this kind of stuff at uh, B-Sides a couple of days ago, there's one guy in the audience that said, you know, there's this new form of economics that says it's all fine. And I said, yeah, I know that New York Times guy, uh, Krugman, but he got the Nobel Prize. And he says, oh, no, you can just keep spending Deficit spending will do no harm at all. Everything will be fine. That's that's the current story. I haven't convinced me because I'm an old fuddy-duddy, but doesn't sound right to me. And uh, Sam, anyway, but Sam, Chipotle, I, yeah. I, I don't know if you you uh, did your research on this one. Well, I'm, why, don't you, why don't you bring it up? I think you're a defender of this stuff. What does it mean? <laughs> well, setting aside the deeper argument between Keynesian versus Austrian economics. Right. The author of this story in Zero Hedge, it, it's he's not actually um, a regular author at Zero Hedge. This is- uh, Oh, everything's like always a, got the same pseudonym. Well, yeah, right. that's right. All Just about all authors on Zero Hedge write under the handle of Tyler Durden, but there are yeah. people, people. But this is just like an, an affiliate thing, which they often do on Zero Hedge. This yeah. was originally uh, published on dailyreckoning.com by a fellow named Jeffrey Tucker. And I don't know if you want to be giving Jeffrey Tucker a platform. Uh, you should look into his, his writings a bit more. And you don't have to go very far. You just look uh, towards the end of this piece. And uh, uh, actually the fourth from last paragraph and he's writing about the White House and the deep state, non-ironically. Yeah, yeah. But the man who appears to believe in the deep state. 
Oh, and sure. I'm not, I'm not endorsing everything this guy says, but I do think he's got a point. Well, I wasn't that much behind. Definitely this shouldn't endorse anything this guy says because he's also a regular, as in a couple times a week, contributor to the Epoch Times. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, this it's actually about is, as nutty as you can get. Well, you know, this is actually a very interesting point, and I've been having I've seen argument on Twitter about this. It's the ad hominem stuff. Do we decide that certain people are evil and will never go with anything they say? I'm, I'm st again in the old school was that any idea is okay, no matter who it comes from, even if it comes from a nut. And the interesting thing is the idea itself. Whereas uh, the modern well, school is sort of the of Amish say, shunning where you just declare certain people evil and turn their portraits to the wall and never speak of them again. That's definitely the modern trend. The, uh, the, this is an entirely different argument. There are a lot of people who still say that the trains ran on time under Mussolini and that fascism is, fascism is a more efficient form of government. Well, the first one, I don't know about. The second one, you can certainly justify. In fact, that's essentially what Xi Jinping says right now. He says that democracy is failing because you can't make up your mind and an autocrat is the efficient form. And there are certain things it does more efficiently, I think. Well, at any rate, this fellow, this Jeffrey Tucker, is a nut job. And it could well bug. be. But most, and many people are nuts. <laughs> even, even by Austrian economic school standards, this guy is a nut job. And so... I think that really does call into question his opinions generally and his agenda generally. Um, now, if, if we want to get into a, the larger discussion of Austrian economics versus uh, Keynesian economics, that's fine. That, that is not an unreasonable discussion, although I, I, I think by and large, uh, Austrian economics is the, the uh, province of the more libertarian fringe of economic thought. It but is. Um, there, are, there are definitely figures in this world who are advancing an extremist worldview. And um, it, oh, sure. uh, Austrian economics is very convenient for their extreme worldview. And, sure. and Sam, on the topic of ignoring people because of their track record and their background, this is not a new phenomenon. So what you're describing is the idea of authority. Um, and this has been around since forever. The idea is that when you are evaluating someone's position or argument, you take into account their authoritativeness. So what's their track record? Are they a crazy person? Do they have lots of, do they have an agenda? Um, this is not like a, oh, these are people we're going to put on our ban list because they're bad people. And by the way, I'm totally in favor of banning bad actors from conversations. Uh, <laughs> um, and like I said, this is not a new idea. This is, like I said, going back to the idea of, of authority uh, in discussions. Um, and if you are dealing with somebody with a track record of extremist beliefs and poor economic ideas, um, it might be a good idea to take their ideas with a grain of salt. That doesn't mean we throw it out, throw everything out with the, we throw the baby out with the bathwater, mm -hmm. but it does mean we do need to you know, take into account the history of this, of the statements of this person, what their agenda might be. Um, I, I know there's been a lot of talk about the death of the author uh, in recent years. I do not entirely believe in the death of the author myself. The, what's um, the death of the author? The death of the author is something like this. Uh, the author's intentions don't matter. Um, all that matters is your interpretation of the literature. Uh, therefore, the author can say that, for example, a character... Um, is supposed to be uh, a bad person, but you read the character as a good person, and that's all that matters. Well, this sounds uh, kind of like a subtweeting J.K. Rowling, so it sounds like. J.K. Rowling absolutely is involved in this death of the author thing because she has some pretty bad views, and a lot of people don't feel comfortable reading her books. Oh, yeah, a bunch of and, people are trying to cancel her now for that, yeah. Right, right, but the idea is that with the death of the author, you can then read the books um, and then you can sort of say, well, what J.K. Rowling thinks or believes is in her work doesn't really matter because it's the way we interpret her works that matter. Whereas I understand that perspective and I do agree that your, your interpretation is important, uh, but I believe in a more symbiosis relationship between the reader and the author where both work together to create the experience. Um, I mean, that's just my, my take on death of the author. Uh, mm. but, but I mean, yeah, we're kind of getting 
yeah this is this is a this is a huge discussion oh it's an interesting um, topic but, but, yeah. but far outside my my knowledge uh but yeah but that that's very different than i, I think you're kind of getting a little bit at can cancel culture which is the idea that mm -hmm. certain people do things like um say racist things and we just want to just be like no you're done which i'm all down for i am 100 percent down for that if people, it's extremely fashionable it, it's fashionable and it's a good way of of dealing with with bad actors uh, because a lot of the times people who espouse bad views try to hide it and sneak back in and push out dangerous ideas and make no make no no difference about it people who espouse racist or hateful ideas are violent and we need to treat their their words <laughs> as a form of violence because it really does put people in danger um, and so, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, if people act in good faith, I'm not okay with, you know, quote unquote, canceling them. But if people are not acting in good faith, if people have a history of violence or using language, um, it's like racism that can lead to violence, uh, then putting them in a timeout box, I think is more than appropriate. Well, uh, my last article will get on another one like this. So we'll see. But anyway, the last thing I want to mention, which appears to be true, is you can now buy Chipotle with Bitcoin and Dogecoin. This article is incorrect about how to set it up, but I set it up. I now have a bunch of Doge on my phone, which I could use to buy Chipotle. So I'm planning Finally. to do that. See how, I know. <gasps> Although using Bitcoin would seem crazy because of the transaction fees, but Doge seems practical. So I'll let you know. Apparently, all United States locations supposedly can now take Dogecoin. I'm highly skeptical. I wonder if I walk in there, if anybody's actually going to know how to do it. But anyway. All right. Well, uh, let's go back to Alan with Clearview again. Unless she has vanished. Oh, no, I'm here. Sorry about that. Sorry about right. that. A, yeah. a very short story from about uh, Clearview AI from Reuters. Apparently, there was a, a, a VC conference in California recently at which uh, Clearview AI made the announcement that um, they would be selling their technology to other types of businesses, entities that they previously have not. A Clearview AI, AI, of course, has gotten into a lot of controversy because they've been essentially, essentially scraping the internet, including social media sites, for people's pictures and then using those pictures to build an enormous database, a truly enormous database of billions of images that can then be used by law enforcement or businesses to identify people in near or actual real time. And of course, there are a number of privacy concerns associated with that. And the ACLU sued Clearview AI um, for their use of uh, these uh, scraped images in uh, selling to businesses. And so they actually won, the ACLU won an agreement so that uh, uh, Clearview AI would no longer do that. However, um, in this conference, Clearview AI announced that they had uh, actually started to sell this technology to a business that is going to, that is selling a facial recognition system to schools in the United States. Hmm. And so these schools will have this tool that draws on the Clearview AI data set that will allow them to identify visitors to schools in real time. So that uh, I guess to, that this is under the guise of improving security in schools. Uh, one of those little tidbits that uh, perhaps reflect some of the uh, political winds in the U.S. after these uh, recent shootings. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like uh, this thing, like only having one door, trying to add security to schools so you don't have to have gun control. Right, exactly that sort of thing. Is it clear that the Ukrainian army is using to identify the dead Russians? It's something like that. Yes, Clearview AI was, at least was, I don't know if they still are, but they were making the technology available to Ukrainian military. Yeah. Yeah, for that purpose. And people were complaining. They say that violated the Geneva Convention when they contacted their relatives, which I guess maybe it does. I don't know. Right, right. Yes. And I don't know if the Ukrainian military stopped doing that, scaled it back. But yes, they were definitely under criticism for doing so. 
I know a lot of big companies like Microsoft canceled their facial recognition program a year or two ago, apparently realizing it's such a minefield, you just don't want to do business there. Well, they didn't cancel them all together. As far as I know, Azure, what are they, whatever they call it, like face, facial recognition and Amazon recognition are still very much alive and well and being used, hmm. um, okay. but perhaps more quietly than before. Yeah. All right. And Caitlin's got uh, guns. Well, not me personally. However, if I wanted guns, it's really not that hard to get, apparently. Apparently uh, not. Yes. So the <laughs> scanner. Here in California, it might be hard here anyway. Well, no, apparently not, even in California. Uh, and as we'll, we'll see in a second. So the scanner.com uh, uh, has an article talking about online extremism and illegal gun sales, uh, which is always goes great together. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's like bread and butter. You know, uh, online extremism and illegal gun sales. What could be better? What could go? What could? What could go more hand in hand? So, what's going on? Uh, while there are communities online, as we all know, of people going into their own sort of bubbles, right? So you have like left wing bubbles, right wing bubbles, libertarian bubbles. In America, we also have this unique thing where we have like militaristic gun bubbles. <laughs> And, and it's really bad. So we talk a lot about gun culture in the United States as if it's like this monolithic thing that we're all part of. Um, but there are gun subcultures that are particularly worrisome. Um, and one of them, or at least problematic, I should say, um, and I don't think everyone in these subcultures are necessarily like extremists, uh, but these subcultures definitely breed extremism. And it's something that we should be looking into. So what happens is that these gun lovers and there's nothing wrong with liking guns. I just want to put that out there. If you like guns, that's your thing. Cool. But a lot of people who really love guns end up joining these sort of small, bubbly groups online of gun enthusiasts who go all out. Um, and, and so they not only talk about how great guns are and how to train, like using your AR-15 in a military capacity, which by the way, the AR-15, I think, is being phased out in the U.S. Army for the M5, I think. I don't know. But um, yeah, uh, a lot of people buy the AR-15 because it's what's standard issued in the military. Um, that's no longer going to be the case. We're actually going to use some more powerful uh, rifles. The AR-15 actually is not particularly that powerful. But but if you're cool, you get the QAR-15, specifically yes. manufactured for QAnon. Yes, exactly. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, but yeah, uh, tactical uh, gun ownership is a thing. And they, they want to look like they're in the military and the military is constantly improving. Uh, so AR-15s, I think, are, are on the way out. I think we're going to see some um, um, more powerful rifles become more mainstream. And they have these videos training people how to use it in a military context, not just how to defend your house from an intruder using ridiculously overpowered rifles, but um, also like how to shoot out of a car, um, you know, stuff like that, stuff that's really applicable only to military situations and not, you know, household stuff. And the rhetoric within these bubbles are very worrisome. So let me give you an example. Uh, the article says, quote, uh, you shouldn't be scared of the NRA. You should be scared of us. One online ghost gun dealer tweeted last week which is something you never want to hear. Um, and it, it is important to note that while we're very concentrated on like school shootings and those crazy one loner gunmen who go around, you know, massacring people, uh, the vast majority of, of shootings happen due to white uh, supremacists. Uh, those are the number one gun owners, gun shooters, uh, and white supremacists breed within these sort of restricted extremist online spaces. Um, and that's what these spaces are doing. So not only are they providing easy access to gun, guns because they're, they're merging these social media bubble zones um, with illegal um, gun selling, essentially they're, they're selling ghost guns. Um, they're also intermingling, intermingling that with, uh, I'm going to say like gun extremism, you know, like military training for guns and, you know, we, we should arm ourselves because of this is the way we deal with 
divisive political issues in our country. Um, and so, for example, the um, gunman um, last month in Buffalo uh, made a claimed in a like a rambling diatribe when before he went out that uh, he was radicalized when the pandemic hit. Um, and he went on these like far right social media groups um, and then did like the technical training there. Um, and so you, the vast majority of people in these groups are not gonna go out and shoot people, uh, but there is a small percentage of people going in there, getting radicalized and, and shooting people. And um, that's what's going on yeah, in America. I yeah, and I mean, the group I saw, I mean, Madison Cawthorn with a group talking about this a few months ago, and my father also believed it, that the whole point of the Second Amendment is so you can revolt against your own government. That's the real point of having all these guns is. Right, but they never actually take up arms against the U.S. government. Not uh, like so I said, the vast, the vast majority of people are white, who, who take up arms are white supremacists who go around shooting just civilians in mm -hmm. the streets. I mean, it's well, yeah. there's very little shooting at the U.S. military or 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 interactions. Um, there was one interaction uh, in 2000, early 2001, I think, in January. Um, but that had actually used very few guns. They just stormed the Capitol. Also in Michigan, they tried, they had right. a bunch of people who wanted to kidnap the uh, governor. Right. Oh, yeah. In Michigan, too, there was a kidnap. That's right. Yeah. So there, there, are, there are two in recent memory where they actually went. But those are, those are, those are the only two I can think of. Um, most, of most of these shooters, most of the people with guns who do violent crime with them um, are not insurrecting the government. They are terrorizing, you know, civilians. Yeah. And I think we can expect a lot more of that. The, the heat still seems to be going up. Yep. And I've read the analysis where they say that is what the, uh, the upcoming political unrest is going to look like. Not an old civil war with an army against an army, but just a lot of like, like the Irish troubles, just a lot of terrorism as small bands of angry people do things like that, blow up churches and such. Right. And so if we want to send that off, we really need to stem it off at the point before people start become extremists. Um, and that's, that's where this article that, comes in. That would be nice, but how do you do it? Like I said, uh, you want to look at where these extremists are being um, molded uh, and getting radicalized and try to shut those down. I mean, we talk a lot about gun, about gun control, but it, it is probably much more effective to go after these um, communities where they're selling illegal guns and stuff like that. And there's already been research into this, specifically with ISIS and um, Islamist terrorist groups online. And there's already a substantial body of academic research that's investigated how these communities form and flourish and then how to shut them down. And what re this research has found is that a lot of people got radicalized in the aughts via uh, the online uh, publications of Al Qaeda and ISIS. And that by deplatforming them from Twitter, Facebook, and Telegram, that uh, those organizations lost a lot of steam and they lost their ability to recruit. And so they lost uh, much of their, their public presence because they were deplatformed. And apparently, um, American companies and American government had no problem doing that back then, since many of these platforms are, of course, American owned. Yeah. So does, does the will exist to do the same with a different kind of very dangerous, very corrosive and insurrectionist uh, political movement? Well, you know, yeah, with a very different ideology. Well, you know, I think the pressure on Facebook to block it has increased, and apparently Elon Musk is not going to buy Twitter, so Twitter will probably continue to push off a lot of people. Right. So that might... Well, it hasn't been undertaken with the same zeal by the U.S. government and by these companies, and that's the problem at this point. Yeah, I think YouTube is a big source of radicalization. And YouTube, yes. Can't forget YouTube. Yeah, right. and I'm not sure they've done much to stop it at all. It and is... Yeah. It is very hard because I love watching flat earther videos. YouTube's doing a very good job of hiding it, hiding their content um, and adding dis disclaimers and stuff like that. Um, I mean, maybe they should do more to, and I'm pretty sure they ban, you know, flat out extremists, you know, violent, racist stuff. Um, so YouTube is doing some stuff to curb 
conspiracy theories and stuff like that. So, well, good. All right. And I've got the one I thought was interesting. Toyota has this little cartridge full of hydrogen that you use to power your gadgets. And this always seemed to be a lot better. I mean, uh, I know somebody has a Tesla or I hear about, I know somebody knows somebody. And apparently the thing takes 24 to 36 hours to charge up, which is ridiculous. I mean, how are you supposed to make a long trip? The original plan when electric cars were originally talked about going mainstream maybe five or 10 years ago is you would just trade your old batteries for fresh batteries. And that's what this thing can do. You just put in a cartridge of hydrogen. So that seems much more practical and they can power a lot of things with it. So um, I, I'd like to see that as opposed to the current generation of electric cars, which seem to me to have a really serious defect and it takes too long to charge them up. Uh, of course, how do you, one, uh, make sure that people can have adequate, adequate uh, access to hydrogen um, in a w way that is cheap. I mean, you need a lot of cheap hydrogen and hydrogen tends to just float away. Uh, most hydrogen, I think that you get through electrolysis you know, of, of water, which is a very expensive process. Um, and then when, once you have that hydrogen, you need to get it to consumers. Um, it needs to last. And also it needs to not explode. And hydrogen has a tendency to explode. So Ooh, yeah, but gasoline is flammable. I don't know what it really not not as water. flammable. Yeah, not not as bad as, as hydrogen. Um, I, I mean, the, the whole idea of gasoline is that yeah, it burns. Um, but it, it really burns best when it's in an aerosol format. Yeah, which is like right before it hits the pistons, you know, Carbon, um, yeah. right. Um, but hydrogen is always in this gaseous format, um, unless you want to chill it to cryogenic temperatures, which would be awesome. <laughs> but, but once again, not, not very practical. Yeah. Is there any other alternative that would be a clean burning fuel that you could reasonably have a pump of and a tank of in your car? Um. I think, yeah, liquid hydrogen and oxygen would be amazing. <laughs> well, but too expensive, I think. Yeah, too expensive. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Toyota thinks they can do it with hydrogen, so we'll see. Yeah, but well, this I has been... There's also death on hydrogen. He said, this is stupid. It's never going to work. That's yeah. why he made the electric cars. Yeah, I've, I've seen hydrogen cars touted for decades. I yeah. have not seen a practical example of it running yet. So we'll we'll. I, the technology may be there. Um, as far as I know, if it was very feasible, we would have had it already. So, Well, you know, I also saw an article, I didn't put in the list here, that they got the first electric airplane working, which is pretty impressive. They can haul all that weight of all the batteries, but apparently it can. Yep. Yeah. yeah. All right. And then Alan has Lotus 123. <laughs> Lotus 123, which has been gone for over 25 years now has been resurrected and ported to Linux, courtesy of Tavis Ormandy, noted security research at Google Project Zero. And uh, Tavis Ormandy has taken his immense talents to uh, resurrect Lotus 1.2.3, which never went away entirely for the, uh, the DOS retro crowd. But uh, um, apparently, uh, uh, the Lotus 1.2.3 has gotten to be rather well, aside from being totally out of date and essentially a command line program um, rather than a GUI program that was supplanted by Excel, um, the, the thing about uh, Lotus 1.2.3 is that it had an enormous user base um, and it also had some interesting features, but around, uh, I think it was 1994, it pretty much uh, stopped being very current. And then IBM, which eventually bought out the company, essentially abandoned support back in the, the aughts, I think like 2012, they finally ended all support for it. Anyway, Tavis Ormandy, I guess he developed something of an obsession. Not only did he port it to Linux, but he also developed um, some uh, plugins or add-ins that allow you to extend the functionality of Lotus 1.2.3. And so this blog post goes through very the interesting process in which he uh, tried to contact a number of uh, former engineers that worked on Lotus 1.2.3 just so that he could find the SDK and this obscure programming language, LPL, that was developed just for developing these add-ins into Lotus 1.2.3. Uh, 
And um, all of these engineers that he contacted told him that they did not have a copy of either because they expected Lotus 1, 2, 3 to be around forever because it was such an industry standard. And it wasn't until uh, Ormandy got a hold of somebody unnamed who was big in the BBS scene of the 1990s and wares of the 1990s that he was actually able to get all of this stuff. Um, so for all that criticism about wares back in the day, this is one example where they actually did a, an immense service to humanity because they held on to this, this anonymous person held on to a bunch of backup tapes that contained the SDK and LPL for Lotus 1, 2, 3, and probably a bunch of other things too. So anyway, it's a, it's a charming write-up of what Tavis Ormandy had to do to figure it out and some reverse engineering and some programming. And he's even got some links here if you want to download some Lotus 1, 2, 3 related binaries. 1, 2, 3 was huge in the 80s and the 90s. I worked at a financial company and my boss did everything in 1, 2, 3. And I was the guy that caused him to make the painful transition to Excel. And boy, he really thought Excel was inferior and everything. And 1, 2, 3 had all these great features, but he did transition. Everybody had to. It was absolutely an industry standard, not a tool I ever used, but I'd certainly heard of it. And I guess it was just so ubiquitous and so important. It's like Microsoft Word. It, it'll never go away. It'll be here forever. But um, it's, a, yeah. it's a lesson worth remembering is that uh, sometimes these tools, no, no matter how popular they are, eventually they do get forgotten. Yeah, well, it didn't keep up with Excel. Yeah. yeah. And also, also, I want to point out, this is a really good reason why we should be using open document formats. Uh, right. Because I know as much as everybody thinks that Microsoft Word is going to be here forever, and likely, you know, it's, yeah, Microsoft Word has been reverse engineered to all get out. Um, a lot of the software that we do take for granted um, as being here forever really aren't. Um, you know, computer programs happen in fads. Yeah. And well, so Microsoft Word did switch to an open document format in 2008. Right. Right, exactly. Um, but you know, you have people who, exam for ex who, for example, drew up plans for a house or a building in the 80s using the popular CAD software at the time. Uh, then, have, then that would later on in the 90s or 2000s or 2010s have to go back, you know, look at those designs and can't open them because they're in a proprietary format for you know 80s CAD designer plus or whatever. You know that no yeah. one, <laughs> no one knows. So, yeah, similar issue. I had a friend call me yesterday. And say they're they're buying like a door smart doorbell and a smart cam camera to monitor their home and they wonder which one to get and i say one big issue is that you expect that stuff to last for like 30 years and in like two or three years they'll go broke and the manufacturer will abandon it there's a huge problem there right i mean i'm i'm all in in favor of having some sort of on-prem system rather than relying on the cloud yeah. for any sort of infrastructure like critical infrastructure for your home like cameras stuff like that. Like if you want to set up security cameras, get yourself some cameras, get yourself a NAS, um, and then you're set. You don't have to worry about the, the company going under. But there, but even so, when they go broke, there won't be any security updates or patches or anything. It's kind that, of a drag. I mean, that that's fine on a home network. Um, if, you, you know, you're, you're very unlikely to be attacked by APT groups on your home network. If they're going to get in through your cameras, but... Uh, you know, definitely if you are in a large environment, uh, if you are working for an industry, mm -hmm. uh, going with people with a long track record of service ability. I mean, that's why a lot of the indus industrial equipment that you buy is so expensive. Yeah. Yep. That's why you get IBM. <laughs> well, the good news is that uh, sometimes when these companies shut down, like Insteon did a couple of months ago, there's still a group of people out there who are able to reverse engineer these, uh, these devices and um, develop firmware um, from various open source projects that allow these devices to have a second life. Yeah, but you're lucky if you, get an if you can get an enthusiastic community supporting it, that's better than nothing. Right, if there's a certain critical mass, then it's more likely to happen. But even the largest companies like Google have abandoned some really major initiatives and projects and left oh, yeah. users stranded. No, this is affecting our city college students. City college switched to free Google Gmail for academics and they changed the rules. They're going to charge for it now. So now after promising all these students that they had a permanent email account, they're now warning them all, you're going to lose your email account. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So anyway, 
So Caitlin is going to land on Venus. I want to hear about this one. Uh, well, okay, not me personally, but uh, CNN has an article by Ashley Strickland. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, talking about how uh, a new NASA spacecraft is going to land on Venus. This is very rare. Very rarely do spacecraft ever land or attempt to land on Venus. Uh, well, they crash. They crash now and then. <laughs> they crash now and then. Yeah, on purpose, mind you. Yeah. I mean, they... They, they crash and they kind of gather readings and that's, that's about it. Uh, as, as we'll see, there's a very good reason for that. Uh, so this new probe is called Da Vinci, the Deep Atmosphere Venus Investigation of Novel Gases, Chemistry and Imaging uh, Mission. NASA really knows how to name their, name their probes. I love it, Da Vinci, chef's kiss. Okay, so um, what's gonna happen? So in uh, 2031, and keep in mind this is, you know, timetables change on space missions all the time. But the plan is uh, by uh, around 2031, the probe is going to land on Venus. Uh, but before it lands on Venus, it's actually going to orbit a few times and take readings of the atmosphere, do very detailed imaging and uh, analysis of its atmosphere, uh, because it's, of course, a very interesting planet. Uh, in terms of its atmosphere. So Venus is very much like Earth. In fact, if it had a thinner atmosphere, we could probably live on Venus, uh, but it doesn't. It has a atmosphere that is, let's see, um, um, uh, 90 times thicker than Earth's atmosphere. And as a result, it is about 462 degrees Celsius on the surface. Um, and in freedom units, that's 864 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so it, it, it and that is all just due to like global warming greenhouse effects. Um, I shouldn't say really, it's always been this warm. It's not really warming, but uh, it did all due to greenhouse effects due to this atmosphere. And of course, right now, global warming is something that we have to deal with on Earth a lot. Um, and so studying Venus is a good opportunity for us to understand how to combat and deal with uh, global warming effects on a smaller scale here on, on Earth. Um, it's also composed of some horrible acid or something, right? It's a well, really hostile environment. Right. Yeah. So, so not only not only is it a very thick atmosphere, um, it has a lot of volcanic activity on the surface, and so there's a lot of like acid rain uh, pouring down. I mean, it's it's a terrible, terrible place. Very little sunlight gets through, but it's also, you know, hot enough to melt, you know, computers and equipment you send down there. Uh, but it is going to try to land. Uh, so at, at the end of its journey, um, it's going to start descending. It's going to descend for about an hour, and it's going to have a heat shield to protect the probe as it goes down. Um, and when it's about 67 kilometers above the surface, um, it will jettison the heat shield uh, and start analyzing the atmospheric gases as it goes through, um, as well as take images. Um, and then it's going to use a very sophisticated technique called uh, litho breaking which is another term of, to say it's gonna hit a bunch of rocks and slow down at about um, 11 uh, meters per second. Uh, so it may not survive the crash, <laughs> the litho breaking. Uh, but if it does, if it does survive you know, hitting the surface, it will have almost 20 minutes uh, to collect some more data before it just gets fried. So. Now the, the solar orbiter is also putting up with extreme conditions, right? Not the... Uh, well, not as much as you would think. Not not like these. The solar orbit orbiter is going to survive. Okay. Uh, this is absolutely not. Uh, like I said, there's, it's very rare that anyone sends probes to Venus. The last one that went to Venus was er, like sort of in the mid 20th century, I think. Like the Venera lander. Um, what was the other one? Um, uh, Magellan. Um, so there was a Pioneer in 1978 and Magellan in the early 90s. So very rarely do probes go to Venus for this reason. Um, and so anytime a probe goes to Venus, it's awesome. And honestly, everyone sort of looks at Mars as the future home base for humanity, like the second home. Honestly, Mars, I think is a no-go. No-go for so many reasons. Um, like, cause I, I think people understand intuitively what it means to live on the surface of Venus, which is like living in an acidic oven, yeah. <laughs> an oven that's raining acid on you. Like, no, but um, people don't really understand what it's like to live on Mars with like nearly no atmosphere, with the uh, uh, sun's radiation. They see these beasts that look very similar to Earth, these rocks. No, no, Mars, I mean, the, the radiation alone is, is bad. Uh, Venus does have a, is very much like Earth, you know, has a magnetic field um, and totally could 
support a reasonable, comfortable living in its clouds. Like if you were to set up like floating cities and had atmosphere, breathable atmospheres inside, it would be relatively comfortable. You could, you could do that. And if we were to terraform a planet, why would we do Mars when we could do Venus? <laughs> I mean, it makes How so much more sense. Could we terraform it? Is there some reasonable yes. way to do it? I've, well, reasonable is, is <laughs> you know. I mean, you can't even see <laughs> the oceans with life or anything. There are no oceans. I mean, there would, would be, there would be, there would be. And that, in fact, that's one of the things that Da Vinci is going to be looking at, um, is that it's going to be looking at the, uh, look for previous uh, signs of oceans on Venus. Uh, though Venus's surface does get paved over very frequently with volcanic material, but it is going to be looking for those things. And if we could thin out Venus's atmosphere um, and we could, you know, terraform it, I mean, yes, Venus could be a very livable planet. It is in the, it is in the Goldilocks zone. Um, it is very much almost the same as Earth. Uh, it, it rotates very slowly, so the days would be very long, and it rotates in reverse, so uh, the sun would set in the east. Um, yeah. Uh, after you know after a few hundred days of sunlight and then a few hundred days of darkness but it has a magnetic field and if we were to terraform it you could easily you know set up some colonies on venus but like i said it, it's not a matter of if it's a matter of practicality um there's i would say you know there's a lot of talk about terraforming other planets before we do anything like that i would say Let's turn Antarctica into a nice place for humans to live first. If we can do that on a small scale in Ant Antarctica, then I think we can use those technologies um, to start looking at other planets like Venus and even, maybe even Mars. I mean, you could live underground on Mars. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what you would do without a magnetic field. I mean, there's no way to terraform that into existence. Uh, but, uh, you know, start small, start on Earth, keep Earth beautiful. Terraform Earth into a very good, sustainable, sustainable place for both humans and animals and wildlife. Um, use that technology and then move to move to Venus. Well, I think the immediate terraforming on Earth is going to be sucking the CO two back out of the air. That's going to be the big issue. That that is you know, and that is a form of terraforming. And like I said, we really need to be focusing these technologies on on Earth and maintaining its environment before we start talking about doing these other planets. I mean, I know futurists like to get people excited, like, oh, we can go to Venus and Mars and stuff. But, you know, we our, our main priority should and always will be, you know, maintaining the environment on Earth. We are the stewards of the planet. Um, let's build the technology that we could use for Mars and Venus later on. And even some of the moons of Jupiter, like Ganymede, um, yeah. here on Earth. Yeah, more. Yep. Well, we are apparently going to have a moon base pretty soon. They're moving that yes. way. Yes. Uh, well, a moon base, yeah, is, is more for engineering and practical right. reasons rather than not to really live there yeah yeah all right and anyway the last one i've got here is a georgetown lecturer um got on twitter and made a single tweet and what he said is when um they appointed the new supreme court or uh, proposed a new supreme court justice he said something which is you know because they restricted it to only black women they didn't really take the most qualified candidate and that was something i think that you could find in a whole lot of newspapers and such but for that He's being fired and blacklisted. He resigned because he said there's no point being here because it's very clear that uh, they can't tolerate it. And you know, this is um, this is the modern world of academia. I've heard many academics complain about it. I've seen plenty of it at my own school. Um, you are live on a razor's edge. One complaint and you're just out. So, uh, well, I, well, you have to understand how these remarks play into racist narratives. Um, and then once you once you take that into account. Then I think you can have sort of discussions, but you really need to understand the context of what you're saying. Like, let's let's be honest, because it, was, it is important that the United States, um, uh, that the United States Supreme Court, you know, be diverse, and that we have voices from various different types of people on the Supreme Court. This is important. Um, and now you could make the point um, that. You know, we're not looking at every candidate, and therefore we were looking just at the most qualified, you know, black woman, you know, to serve on the Supreme Court. Um, and and that, that's that's fair enough. But if you try to point out that um, that we're like, I don't know, and and this is this is a that this is somehow a bad thing 
uh, um, and that that we're we're cheating ourselves out of the quote unquote best candidate, uh, whatever that means, and and that is you know um, by by choosing this black woman. I mean, you're playing into some racist narratives. So you really like you can discuss these things, uh, but you need to fully understand the context of of what you're saying. Um, and you know how to how to phrase it in a way that you're not playing into you know white nationalist talking points. Well, uh, I I think if you are an academic, you cannot discuss it. You will just I mean, be fired for even raising the topic. Well, I mean, what 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 subject was this professor teaching? I don't know, but if he was just put, but I put out one tweet, which was not related to a class, and that was the end of him. That's why I'm thinking the the. Uh, the logical message is professors that want to preserve their jobs should not use social networks at all, I would think. I mean, that is true, not just for college professors. Uh, you really do need to be aware of what you're posting online. Um, anything can be, anything you say can and will be used against you. Um, but if you are going to post controversial things or if you are going to talk about touchy subjects, know first really how to how to talk about them and how to do so in a way that's not going to play into racist narratives. Because I, I do think there is a discussion to be had, um, you know, about the best way to, you know, assign judges in the Supreme Courts. Uh, yeah. But you definitely want to be aware that when we're discussing this specific case, uh, not to fall into the trappings of you know, like what white nationalists would, would want to talk about. Um, even even well, if your intentions are quote unquote good, um, you, you really need to be aware of what you're, what you're talking about. And I, I've seen this recently, especially with Pride Month and a bunch of people putting out Pride stuff, but putting things out in a way that, I, you know, it's like, you know, really that's, <laughs> um, no, like your, your intentions are good, but. <laughs> no, at my school, they say you must be sensitive, but. I, uh, in practice, it's pretty much an unknowable thing. Like I remember Chelsea Manning got canceled by saying something that was used the wrong word for trans people or something. It just, it just seems to be a minefield. It is a minefield. And if you're uncertain about how to handle a topic or handle a discussion that's sensitive, just don't bring up that discussion. That's where we are. And that's why people are forming the, like the new institution in Austin, it is a new thing for academia to just say we can never talk about certain topics. Um, that's, uh, I'm not sure it's wise at all, but that is definitely where we are. The right. problem I have with all this discourse, and, and Sam, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to single you out on this, is that it's presented as free speech. It's presented as I'm just expressing my views or I'm just exercising my First Amendment rights. And that's well, not really what's at question here. That's not being debated. No, I don't think any of that. I just think this is uh, academic discussions. Go ahead. Well, academic discussion or any organization. There have been plenty, as Caitlin said, there have been plenty of people, not in academia, who have been fired for things that they have posted on social media or that oh, they're yeah. in public and saying. And so the question is, is it, uh, is it a good idea or is it defensible or is it reasonable to fire somebody for saying something online? And I think the answer is yes. And the reason for this is when somebody says something, it can expose their thoughts on a given topic. Now, most people's thoughts on a given topic are benign or uncontroversial, and that's fine. But if somebody's expressing a view that is inimical, inimical to the organization's values, then that person really cannot function inside of that organization. Case in point, if a professor or instructor in this case, law professor at a school is expressing views that really put into question that person's ability to uh, treat or to view students and colleagues uh, in uh, a fair, impartial, non-racist, non-biased fashion, then maybe they cannot function within that organization. Maybe they shouldn't be a part of that organization. Now you can parse the language of this tweet and I know Shapiro goes into a long 
you know, diatribe about all this. If you look at the Wall Street Journal article, you can see more about what he said here. But just from principles, we're not talking about the specifics of this case, but just on a, a, the basis of our principles, I think it is reasonable for an organization to say that this person should not be in this organization because their values are fundamentally at conflict with the values of this organization and with our being able to create a, an environment that is welcoming to all employees and students. And I think that's an entirely reasonable position. I think that is a good thing, in fact. You don't want to have uh, extremists advocating for, I don't know, this is a popular one, Sharia law in law schools. You know, you probably don't want to have that in an American law school. That is not a viewpoint that is consistent with uh, uh, American values or with the Bill of Rights or with the Constitution. So you just don't do that in the first place. On right. the other hand, you probably don't want to have somebody who's saying that uh, uh, a woman who is Black and has been nominated for the Supreme Court, has been confirmed for the Supreme Court, is not qualified for the position. You probably don't want to have that. So right. that, that's, that's really the, the fundamental argument here is that there are certain views that are simply incompatible with an organization's values. And then the organization in that case does have a responsibility to not condone that and to possibly fire the person responsible for these views. Right, and, and as, as I was saying, it's not so much that we can't have these discussions um, no one's going to argue if you're insensitive enough, you might lose your job. Uh, but knowing how to be sensitive to these topics um, and it is all that's really necessary. And you can have these discussions. They're not, you know, it is all about, like, like Alan said, it is all about people's exposing people's internal biases that are getting people in trouble, not the topics themselves. That's certainly the the standard narrative, but I don't see anything of that here. Anyway, this is this is a big issue. I know another case I heard about was a uh, politics professor who now has to have every question she wants to ask her class approved in advance by lawyers to make sure that maybe it wouldn't offend somebody. So I I think I think we've gone too far in this uh, muzzling speech stuff, but uh, we're certainly very far that way. I, like I said, I really don't think that's the case at all. I know there are a lot of people uh, who do, in fact, have their speech essentially muzzled that they didn't before because suddenly, you know, their ideas are being posted to the world. Everyone can see them. And suddenly people are freaking out because their friends and family and local community didn't have any problem with them espousing racist or sexist views. But suddenly when it becomes public, you know, people start freaking out and, you know, demand that they get fired because they're saying racist, you know, things and people are calling it, you know, cancel culture. We can't have our discussions. All we want to do is, you know, have a reasonable discussion. Well, no, you really, you really don't. Um, the re there is a reason why people are getting upset. Um, and I, I have not seen instances where people in good faith um, are getting fired or are getting in huge trouble, even when they make really bad gaffes. Um, if it's in good faith, like it's just an absolute mistake, you know, and, and it's obvious it's a mistake. Like I've, I've not seen that, um, but that's a common narrative among people who have questionable views uh, to say that they're being silenced uh, because, you know, they can't go on Twitter and say things like, you know, Mexicans are, are you know, dirty people taking our jobs. I mean, no, you can't do that. You you don't. That's only appropriate for the president. That's only appropriate for the president. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I mean, the, but there's a lot of people who want to say that and they do feel like uh, they do feel oppressed that people object to this. Um, and that's where a lot of this cancel culture narrative comes from is people saying, hey, you know, this isn't appropriate um, on the wider scope, even though in your local community, you and your you know white nationalist friends, you know, think it's just fine to say these terrible things. Um, 
but when you start putting putting them up to the public where everyone can see them and we can all see what kind of person you are well you know yeah i mean that, that's that's where this whole council culture thing seems to be coming from yeah well this is our society uh splitting apart it's not good well anyway splitting apart is not new well it seems a whole lot worse lately not at all i mean yes we we've seen a greater radicalization of life, yeah. certainly in the post-trump era but these currents have always been present in america oh, sure it's not like the 50s were some idyllic time of peace and racial harmony far oh, from no. it. No, I think it's more like before the time of the Civil War. And you know, when I grew up, it was the Vietnam War, where there was, again, a great schism in society, but nothing like what we have now. Uh, well, right. it's, it's just become more visible in some ways. It's become more overt in some ways. No, I think the problem is, um, it looks to me like we're no longer going to be able to cooperate on elections and share a government. And that was not even true in the Vietnam War time. Yes, but the ideological pinnings have underpinnings have always existed. Oh, sure. The U.S. has always been very fertile ground for various social divisions, racism, uh, extremism, etc. Yeah, it's but somehow that, we all shared a certain belief in our elections and system, system of democracy, which we no longer seem to share. Well, the question is who shares these beliefs and who is able to weaponize antagonism yeah. against mm -hmm. these beliefs. What we're entering in, into is a period of greater discord right now because it's, it is a, we're undergoing a period of demographic change and also ideological change. Yeah. Okay, and, so just- Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say, I, was gonna, I, I, I read the article that, that Sam posted and I think there's a bit more context here um, that, that's missing. Uh, first of all, uh, what he tweeted apparently was um, uh, that, the Supreme Court, the, the fact that they chose a, a black woman means that it would have been a lesser potential nominee. Um, and, and he did later apologize for it two days later. <laughs> it took him two days. Uh, but apparently he has a history of some very questionable beliefs, um, including, um, you know, uh, being uh, against things like affirmative action um sense, yes you know and you know and 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 so his his public and personal policies are very much at odd with his employer's uh, political views uh so it's not just this one tweet it looks like there's a whole bunch of things that make him you know ill-suited uh to this to the person's current position yeah, I mean, where he's working is essentially like a Christian university that has a set of values and you must promote these particular values. And uh, that I think is something that uh, it, not well, I mean, expected from a secular well, university. Well, you're, you're equating it to religion, well, yes. but, that's not the, but that's not the case when it comes to certain, um, certain beliefs or ideologies. So every institution has a set of core ideologies that you must buy into in order to work there. And it doesn't matter if you are working for, you know, a college or if you're working for a large company. Um, this is standard practice. Well, this is there are actually two ways to do it. I mean, Coinbase just did the opposite. An alternative way to run a company is we're just here to do the, the company. We're not here to promote any particular political but, values. But that is part of the culture at that company is to say we we do not tolerate discussions of you know political issues. That's not the culture yeah. at every company and That's every institution. Um, and that's one of the values. And so if you go to Coinbase and you're like, no, I must talk about political stuff all the time because it's so important to me, and then you might get fired for that because you're going against that company's culture. And this is not a religious yeah, thing. That's right. Okay. This is, you know, a, a top down cultural thing of the institution. Um, and if the institution, for example, very much believes in things like, you know, affirmative action, you know, racial equality, and that's a core value that that they're going into. And a lot of institutions that deal with the public, especially when you're dealing with um, communities of, of color, very much need that to be part of their identity and part of their, their work culture, that they, people are sensitive to these issues. Uh, and so getting fired because you are espousing things that are counter to the inclusive culture that the college is trying to foster is reasonable, to be honest. 
Uh, now, if now if you are working for a conservative Christian college, and they, you know, especially if you're working for one of those Christian cults who believe that um, white people are superior and they draw Jesus as white, you know, and stuff like that, you know, then these views might be might be more appropriate and in line with the with the culture of that college. Um, but it is definitely, it, but I mean, once again, we're sort of getting back to religion, but I do want to point, but the whole point was that it is not this religious fanaticism of the institutions that say, hey, you're not a good fit because you say this or do that. This is a very common practice. Every institution has a culture and sort of expects certain beliefs from the people working there. So a good example of this is uh, if you are working in a pharmacy and you are expected to give medication to people. Uh, now, in normal American life, it is normal to come across people who are adamantly pro-life, um, like something like 20% of the American population is like very pro-life. You cannot work at a, a pharmacy where you're giving out contraceptives, giving out, you know, plan B um, contraceptives um, if you are pro-life and refuse to do that job. Yeah, well. Colleges are certainly taking that attitude, for better or worse. And and like I said, these are social institutions that work with a lot of communities, uh, including communities that are predominantly in, engaged with people of color. And so, you know, it, it's not just some arbitrary decision that we're that the colleges are going to, you know, support students of color. I mean, this is just part of their job, what they're supposed to be doing. So, all right. Well, I think I'll leave it at that. I've got to go off and teach a class at RSA anyway. So uh, I think we will not be back on Friday. I'll be on an airplane. And uh, after that, I'm not sure if we'll be able to do it next Tuesday. And Friday, we might be off for a couple of weeks. Um, or we might be back a week from today. I'm not quite sure yet. All right, I'm turning it off.